Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. I hope that 2024 is off to a good start for you. Welcome to the Media Education Lab. This is the Inequalities and Media Education webinar series. And while this is the first webinar in the series for this particular year, it's actually the fifth webinar in this particular series. And I'm going to add links to chat for you soon to be able to look at the history of the webinar series as well as materials available for this particular webinar. So today we're going to be speaking on participatory action research and media literacy. Um, there are four authors to this chapter, and we have two of the authors present here. Uh, we have uh, Chidam Bozda, who is from the University of London, and Anamiria Meg, who is also from the same university. And um, they are both assistant professors there. Uh, and their interests are digital media, digital literacy, inclusion, and media education, um, as well as uh, Dr. Neig has done work on unaccompanied refugee youth across four European countries. I'm going to be adding a lot of links uh, about them in chat in a minute. And without wasting any more time, over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, together with Chick, then we're going to present um, this chapter. But uh, actually, as Devina said, uh, there are all uh, in total four uh, authors for this chapter, so um, we just wanted to highlight this. Um, I will first start, and then Chigdem will take over uh, the presentations, and we're um, very happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, at the end of our presentation. So, uh, Chigdem, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So uh, as said, this was co-authored with Kuller and uh, Sprenger from Utrecht University, uh, and it uh, has been published um, in a uh, in the series uh, of or about this series, the media literacy and education, and the book is called Media Literacy and Media Education Research Methods. And we have uh, Pierre and Normand here, so hi from here. It's the first time we actually see each other, but it, it has been a um, uh, a great experience and we're very happy to see our chapter uh, published because this is actually something that's very important to all of us to talk about more uh, participatory methods in research in general, but in sp specifically in uh, media literacy and media education. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, uh, check them. Okay. Um, so we became interested in the possibilities that uh, participatory action research holds for media literacy and media education research through our own project and interest. Uh, I might I might say this because uh, for me, for instance, it wasn't uh, self-evident to go and try with the participatory methods, but because uh, the research field didn't turn out as I expected, I realized that I had to change my methods in order to be able um, to be more reflective and uh, get a bit closer to my own participants. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later on. Um, and one of the most important points, as is highlighted in this quote from Martin Mastro Matteo and Tarango here, is that actually uh, PAR, or so uh, participatory action research, may offer new opportunities to bridge the perspective of uh, academics, but also practitioners and learners uh, in media literacy education. What actually the two authors say is that uh, PAR's relationship with media literacy has um, been characterized as a new hope for research and practice. Um, but what is this new hope that they are talking about? Uh, the new hope mentioned in this quote refers to the strong potential there is in combining PAR and media literacy as these two approaches could mutually strengthen and enhance each other. Um, because, as the next quote shows, they connect in their goals, in their purposes, and also more general ideas of improving the human being. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, we started off our chapter with a bit more of theoretical background, and a bit more embedding in, uh, um, in theory to, to see how we can uh, combine both media literacy and PAR. 
And we actually emphasize two essential thinkers that can aid all those who are interested in applying FAR principles in media education. And some of you might be obviously familiar with these two thinkers. One is, um, uh, first one is Paulo Freire and the other one is Bell Hooks. So why did we choose these two uh, authors and thinkers? Uh, first of all, we build on Freire and his uh, well-known pedagogy of the oppressed, uh, which is fundamental uh, for us to the pro approach to FAR that we advocate in our chapter. Freire actually recognized that critical pedagogy has a potential for raising critical consciousness, which is really, really important in media education as well. Uh, he, he argued actually that for research and education to contribute to the, to the liberation of the participants, very importantly, uh, it should be problem posing rather than problem solving and should include the active participation of participants to create meaningful and transformative outcomes. So the most important idea here is, here is, is not about pro that media literacy as well should not be about problem posing rather than about problem solving, problems that are um, something important for the community, for the learners, for, for those who want to change uh, their communities. And then uh, the second book that we are um, building our um, chapter is the um, Teaching to Transgress uh, Education as a Practice of Freedom, uh, which was uh, published in 1994 by, by Bell Hooks. And in this book, she proposes an engaged pedagogy for genuine learning based on recognizing the agency of the students that can achieve by expressing themselves. And uh, we all know uh, those who work in media literacy that this is something essential uh, agency is very important in media education as well. Um, we argue that while majority groups are often studied from an asset-based approach, um, research conducted on non-majority groups, so uh, for instance, migrant students or um, minority students uh, within these societies commonly focus on deficiencies. So what is not working in their education, how we can help them and so on and so forth. But what we're actually asking here is, and which is something really connected to media literacy as well, is that who, who tells the stories? How are they told? Who has the right to speak for the silence? Uh, who benefits from the stories that are told? And we know from media research and media studies as well that uh, these are very complex and difficult questions to answer. But we think that this can actually guide us in um, media literacy research as well. And what we argue, and next slide please, is that obviously this is a, a great approach and it makes it more participatory and it makes it more engaged, but however we know that there are quite many challenges that if we decide to go on this road. So we, in this chapter we decided to openly talk about these challenges in order to help somehow researchers uh, or educators who might want to try, uh, try out this methodology. Um, we know that time and resources and obviously funding are very limited. Um, and I, we also think that it's important that researchers are open about all these limitations. But in the same time, we also try to find ways to ensure a project output or networks are safeguarded beyond the limited time spans of projects. And we know that this is actually very difficult to do because we have let's say one year or two year, three years for a project, but it's very, it's very difficult uh, to stay in these networks later on or to help the networks grow once the project is finished. Um, it's very important to know that people who are joining a PAR study are asked to basically volunteer their time, energy, and labor. Um, we as researchers, we must ensure that the interests of participants are served um, otherwise, participants will not join and will opt out, um, and quite rightly so, because they should actually feel that the study is for them and that we as researchers care about their issues and about their problems. Um, establishing and maintaining successful alliances between researchers and particip uh, participants should be enabled um, so that the research process can be planned, implemented, and disseminated. And this is usually very intensive and time consuming. Um, 
we know that sufficient time, resources and energy need to be invested, which are often lacking in academia. Uh, another challenge that is important to uh, highlight here is that um, achieving genuine commitment from all participants. So let's say participant, uh, um, so it's a project uh, po policymakers or uh, educators and learners. Um, it's quite difficult to get a commitment from everybody, um, and this can be daunting uh, given the many expectations, interests um, that the community might want to serve. And of course, we always have to remember of the power relations that exist within and between communities. Um, so it is very important that before we start the project, we actually try to secure the commitment of all the parties who are uh, involved. Um, it can also be another obstacle to establish a shared understanding of problem definitions uh, and aims within a group of stakeholders who might have uh, varying interests. So to go back to the previous example, policymakers might have very different problem definitions compared to, let's say, educators or students or uh, pupils themselves. So it, this is something that uh, researchers need to think about and need to um, solve while the project, before and while the project is ongoing. Um, and finally, uh, given that power relations within communities and among networks, having the participants make joint decisions to undertake um, individual or even more difficult collective actions that benefits all of them can be quite challenging and it's not easy um, to go past these challenges. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, them. So after uh, we discuss some of these challenges and some of the uh, uh, ideas that we have beyond um, or trying to solve these issues, uh, the next uh, slides we want to uh, present some of the projects that we have done in which we employed uh, participatory methods. Uh, this first one um, was called Media Literacy through Media Making and it was led, led by our colleague Kuhn and Sane. And um, it was uh, it, it was done between uh, 2017 and 2019 in the Netherlands, and the project sought to catalog the media repertoires of young newcomers to Netherlands, uh, refugees in particular, to see how their media literacy, skills, media literacy skills could be harnessed to address their own aspirations, needs, and desire through making media. Um, the project took a poor approach to develop a 10-day critical media literacy curriculum, which was co-designed with students and teachers uh, through interviews and focus groups. So we also prepared a, a short video to show um, about this project. So um, check them if you can try to start the video. Twee meisjes. Twee meisjen. Uh, die en die. En uh, die is de broer van, uh, van die meisjes. In het voorjaar van 2017 werd een lespakket mediawijsheid aangeboden aan 100 leerlingen van Ithaca. Ithaca Internationale Schakelklasse biedt onderwijs aan leerlingen in de leeftijd van 12 tot 18 jaar die zich voorbereiden op een toekomst in Nederland. En de mafia bots is hier daar. Hij moet wegrennen. Maar dan de politie heeft hem gepakt. Hallo! De voornaamste taak van deze school is het doorschakelen van anderstalige jongeren naar het Nederlandstalige onderwijs. Ook stelt de school zich een pedagogische opdracht. Namelijk om deze leerlingen in Nederland een veilige vluchtheuvel te bieden. Zodat ze ruimte voelen om zichzelf als mens weer te kunnen herkennen. Well, I told her she belongs to me, that goes forever. And we just got closer when we're not together. We took the last boss that was a right together. Bars and property. Het lespakket Mediawijsheid is ontwikkeld door een team mediadocenten van de Universiteit Utrecht. Voor leerlingen tussen de 16 en 20 jaar van verschillende leerniveaus. Aan het eind van dit schooljaar zullen zij doorstromen naar vervolgonderwijs. In de lesserie van 10 dagdelen lag de focus op het zelf maken van media. Om actief en kritisch te leren omgaan met beschikbare media 
werden die jongeren getraind als makers in plaats van ze te begrenzen als consumenten. Daarnaast werd er aandacht besteed aan het eigen verhaal en de toekomstdromen van de leerlingen, waardoor het maakproces en hun eigen reflectie daarop ook als social empowerment diende. De jongeren oefenden in de dramatische opbouw van een beeldverhaal en dachten na over identificatie en overtuiging van de kijker. Deze opdrachten hadden als doel dat de jongeren leren filteren wat mediamakers willen dat men gelooft, koopt of ondersteunt. Oké, okay, so thank you. That was Kun and Sunny's project. And the next project that I want to talk about is my own. Um, this was uh, um, called Media Literacy for Unaccompanied Refugee Youth. And it was also between 2017 and 19 and was funded by uh, the European Union to uh, media, um, to uh, Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship. Um, and I just want to run through a bit of the difficulties I had before I decided to go with more participatory methods Um, the aim of the project was to uh, focus on the lived media experiences of unaccompanied young refugees in four European countries, uh, the Netherlands, Sweden, Italy, and the UK. And um, originally, uh, we wanted to understand how they use digital technologies and social media in order to create media literacy educational materials that can help them uh, in their integration in the new countries. Um, There was the, uh, it was planned to have a short um, a pilot project in the Netherlands. I was coming from the UK then um, to try out the methodology because originally we planned to have um, an online diary, uh, focus groups, interviews, and participant observation. Um, and I actually came here to the Netherlands and um, I went to uh, these accommodation centers where the young people were living. And they were quite uh, friendly and quite nice, and it went all well. It was I had a informed consent translated it into three or four different languages, of of course, based on where the young people were coming from. I had planned uh, everything ahead with an NGO who was um, working as a gate uh, gatekeeper or gate op opener in that sense. Um, we had planned to have an, uh, um, a media diary which was working on phones. It wasn't an app, but it was um, developed to work on, on smartphones. And I went to and I tried to explain to them, the young people, and um, it turned out that they didn't understand what I was asking them to do. Uh, very interestingly, um, some of them were illiterate, so in their own languages as well. Uh, or had very low literacy skills. Others were more skilled, but they wouldn't understand how they need to use a website, for instance. They will keep asking, um, so it's Google? Do I need to go on Google? Because for them, the internet was Google and at that time, Facebook or whatever, Instagram, other um, apps that they were using. So it was very quickly clear that this methodology won't work and I won't be able to record or to understand how they use digital technologies and social media. So I actually came back from the Netherlands uh, and went back to the UK um, to rethink my whole methodology. And at that point, we, we realized that we need to have more participatory methods um, in order to uh, be able to collect data. Another important point here is that Uh, working with very vulnerable group, groups such as unaccompanied refugee youth, it's very important to know that many of them have been in interview situations over and over again with governmental officials. Uh, this is a very important thing to, to remember because I wanted to do an interview with them. So they were thinking, who is this person? Is this somebody sent from the government? Will this affect my asylum claim? So and so, so, so forth. So in order to create a safe environment and an environment which is a bit different to what they had experienced before, I collaborated with, a, with an artist and we basically created two board games uh, that focused on uh, uh, one of them we call the Apple clock, which you can see on your which left, I guess, where you can see the sun, the moon and uh, all the others. 
and in that I asked them to um, write or just say it uh, out loud how do they start the day, uh, what kind of um, apps they use throughout the day, they would go to school, they have lunch, uh, they uh, hang out with, your, with their friends, so on, so forth, so they could post, uh, put the post-it on the board, while the other was um, uh, another board game in which um, I had cut out the most used um, uh, apps. You can see their uh, Instagram, mail, whatever. And I asked them to group them according to the activities, which one they use to keep in touch with your family, which one you use to get to know new, new people, um, to go shopping and so on and so forth. So actually this turned out to work much better because it was based uh, on a very um, universal thing, which is uh, play. We all, right, we all like, like to play, and I will try to introduce this feeling of playing um, uh, to, to get closer to our participants and to have uh, more agency on their side. Um, eventually, after collecting all the data, I went to the UK where I worked with another NGO, um, and they had uh, a group where they, uh, of uh, young uh, um, refugees who they worked uh, with, and I was embedded in this group for a longer period of time. Um, and here uh, I train, we train the, the young people to uh, do interviews with other young refugees and asylum seekers in terms of their media use, their media needs and so on and so forth. And eventually we got together, um, they brought their interviews, we talked about the most important things that their, colli their colleagues and friends talked about. And we co-created teams based on this research and the previous research, uh, previous phases of the research that I have done. And eventually uh, we went to the BBC uh, as a matter of thanking them uh, that they participated in this. And it actually it was a great, um, great event for them to see how the BBC works from the inside. So that was um, uh, a, great, um, a great end of the project. So this is basically uh, my, uh, my project and I will leave that now to, to check them to continue with her own. Thank you, Anna Maria. Um, my project uh, is actually also funded by the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions of the EU um, and just recently actually came to an end in November. Uh, I had some delays uh, throughout the project. Um, and it was uh, a school research uh, designed with participatory action research principles um, based in Bremen uh, in a rather uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhood and a very culturally diverse neighborhood. Um, so my aim was uh, looking at digital inequalities within this uh, school context and also finding out ways to empower young people for developing their media literacy skills by using uh, participatory action research. Um, and I started this research in January 2022, uh, 2020. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, it was uh, then after March, uh, really uh, severely uh, influenced by the pandemic. Uh, but luckily, I could continue my research uh, in the school online and offline. Um, I had already uh, built some trust relationships with the students, with the teachers. They agreed to continue. And the project got a new dimension because it was focusing on digital inequalities. It was really interesting to follow the developments uh, with the pandemic as well. Um, and uh, what I did in the project was, firstly, I uh, participated in the classroom. I got to know the teachers and the students. Um, for quite a long time. And then I also did uh, some interviews and focus groups. Uh, one thing that was important here was to leave the focus groups uh, with the students uh, as open as possible to bring their uh, own perspectives to the front. So I was more uh, of a facilitator, uh, encouraging them to discuss their own uh, ways of using digital media. Um, and also raising their own uh, the, the, their own perceptions of their problems within the digital environments. And then um, uh, after uh, all this, we also started uh, talking about teaching content. So that was also one of the aims of the project, uh, together with the teachers and also with the students, developing teaching content or what, what we call uh, learning scenarios um, together with the 
uh, teachers and also the students um, on topics that are related to media literacy, but that are also relevant for them, that they raise themselves uh, in the discussions, in the focus groups, that they problematize themselves. Um, one topic was, for example, one of the central things was time management with digital media. Uh, several students reported that they couldn't sleep, that they didn't even realize when the uh, as how the time goes by. This was already the case before the pandemic started, that they were saying uh, that they stay awake um, until two, three o'clock. Sometimes they are often lacking sleep uh, during the school days. Uh, one specific thing here, maybe um, most of the uh, students that I spoke with here did not have many limitations from the outside. So they were mostly um, free with their digital devices. Sometimes there were interventions uh, through their parents, but this was not um, uh, always the case. Um, so time management was one thing that, ca uh, that came out uh, from these discussions that we also addressed in the teaching content. Um, other topics were, for example, uh, netiquette, uh, rules in WhatsApp communications, hateful comments and how to deal with them, discrimination, um, uh, but also more uh, entertaining topics like influencers, for example, how they make money, how they produce their content. So we included uh, these different topics in the learning scenarios. And these learning scenarios, the topics were also discussed together with the students. I should maybe mention also one thing about this particular school. Um, I think generally uh, to make a point about participatory action research in the school context, I think one of the most challenging things is that uh, you are, as a researcher, coming to a already quite hierarchical uh, or, uh, institution with existing power relations and with a uh, mostly top-down set program curriculum. So that, that is a, quite a challenge to bring in a new topic and also try to uh, create something collaboratively despite these existing hierarchies. But this particular school, and that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to do this uh, within this school, was a, a special school that was reformed um, uh, 10, 10 years ago or 13 years ago now. Um, and it included aspects or methods from democratic schools, intercultural education, and also from critical pedagogy. One interesting thing, for example, here was that they always had open doors in the classrooms. The students could walk into the uh, spaces within the school, do their projects, come back to the classroom. They had glass doors. Um, and also they had uh, things like, for example, the class parliament, that they met weekly as a community, the classroom, together with the teachers, sat in a round uh, group and uh, sat in a circle and discussed the matters of the class, uh, the, the community aspects, but also how they want to learn, how, how they are doing generally and so on. So this was also the place where I wanted to discuss these learning scenarios and the topics. Um, because it was the most uh, equal ground to be able to discuss and develop something together. Um, so they also, the students also had uh, inputs in these uh, learning scenarios. And then um, together with the teacher, we had some ideas, but we also uh, tried to, because of this, we call these learning scenarios, we tried to design the um, class hours that we did together um, as open as possible, as student-centered as possible. So to give you some examples, we let them do their own experiments with, for example, digital detox, letting digital devices um, away for a whole evening and then reflecting on this uh, on their own, but also in the classroom by interviewing each other. Uh, another thing that we did was designing a survey on media use uh, to encourage them to become more kind of like critical um, thinkers about their own media use. So they designed the survey, we put that together. Of course, they had different ideas. So we kind of combined all their uh, forms into one and then they went out um, to the other, other classrooms, uh, filling out these surveys and then came back to the classroom. Uh, they evaluated the results and they also kind of reflecting uh, self-reflected their own use in comparison to their uh, uh, neighbor classes. 
we also ask them to fill out forms about their screen times uh, in different days and their activities uh, by using different apps. So uh, all these activities were, were in a sense designed um, in a way to encourage the students to question uh, things rather than trying to teach them certain competencies in a top-down way. Um, of course, this, like I mentioned, this was tr uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, towards the end of the implementation of the learning scenarios, they had to go online again. So um, some of the topics were not uh, discussed uh, fully because the students had other worries and so on. Um, but still, we tried to work on these and we actually made these learning scenarios also available for other teachers um, later on, but it's unfortunately only available in German at the moment. But if anyone is interested, I'm more than happy to share it. Um, so these were some of the examples from this project. Uh, I already mentioned some of the challenges uh, of school doing school research, but I think this links to other challenges that Anna Maria uh, mentioned in the beginning of the project. Um, so how to continue this, for example, trying to uh, communicate the results to others, um, but also make sure that this is uh, implemented further. This was also a challenge. Um, as the school is changing, the school administration, teachers are changing, how to develop ways of sustainable uh, development in this sense. Um, so I think I will leave it uh, at this. Uh, these are all questions that I still have uh, partly about the project that I want to still follow up on, uh, also in future projects that I will wor be working on. Um, I would like to then uh, continue with uh, more, like move away from the case study and then uh, get back to the uh, principles that we discussed at the end of our chapter. Uh, looking at the challenges of participatory action research and also for, in a sense, offering guidelines for people who are interested in adopting participatory action research for media literacy, for developing media literacy or for doing uh, media literacy uh, research. Uh, we believe that a multi-stakeholder perspective is quite important. I already uh, talked about this in the research uh, that I did, for example. You need to include the students, but also the teachers need to be convinced if you are going to do a project within the school context. They need to also benefit from it by, for example, developing teaching content um, and also by learning from this process. Uh, and it is also important to make sure that all stakeholders can represent themselves despite the existing hierarchies. And we need to take into account that every context that we will be working in has existing uh, power relationships. We need to also work around that and also address that um, in our research. Um, another point is about um, bridging ethics on paper and ethics in practice uh, and seeing ethics also as an ongoing process. That's an important point as well. So it is not just a checklist to do in the beginning of the project, but there needs to be there needs to be uh, several checkpoints throughout the research project. It's important to make sure that everybody um, understands the process um, and uh, that it is communicated in ways that is accessible to the participants. Um, by translating information, by simplifying or putting information in more simple terms than uh, the legal ethical documents, for example. And also always coming back to this point and making sure that everyone is informed about their rights within this uh, uh, process. Uh, participatory action research is also about the process, uh, about the ethical process, but also about the learning process. Uh, Anna Maria already mentioned uh, Freire, for example, critical pedagogy. It's not about the answers, but more about the questions. It's more uh, about the process than it's about the product. Um, but of course, this is uh, this is also a challenge uh, in a system, in an academic system where products are overvalued in a sense. Um, but adapting these methods, we need to be aware of this. Um, and also this process should include reflection and self-reflection about the role that we play as academics, uh, cr not creating knowledge, but rather co-creating knowledge together with the people, uh, rather than creating knowledge on the people as one of the core principles of participatory action research. Uh, with this, I am uh, coming to the conclusion of the presentation.
And so we started this chapter by asking if um, uh, participatory me uh, action research could be a perfect fit for media education and media literacy research. We believe that uh, uh, that we could present through these examples and through our discussion that it's a really good fit. Uh, it it does, does offer new ways of engaging with media literacy for understanding uh, media practices of marginalized people, especially for bringing their perspectives to the fore. Um, it, there, this also goes hand in hand with a general shift, of course, in the academia. So you, you see a lot more participatory action researches, um, which, which comes also together with this general shift towards more engaged methods with this emphasis on public engagement. But there is, of course, the danger that comes with it, um, the danger of tokenism. And we would like to here emphasize that it is important to engage truly uh, with, with the research uh, participants and their interests and their benefits. Um, and uh, another point is about the limitations that we face as academics uh, in a world that uh, uh, is based on metrics like uh, citation, uh, citations, high impact publications, uh, more uh, classical uh, or classically perceived um, uh, research outputs. Maybe it is also important to advocate for reward and recognition models that also recognize these processes of learning, processes of creating transformation and impact within a particular community. So this should also be on the agenda for people who value these kind of participatory methods. Um, and we do believe truly that that um, participatory action uh, research has uh, enormous potential for more innovative ways of uh, doing media literacy research. and leading to transformations, especially for people who are marginalized in the digital environments. So I will finish with this. Thank you very much for your attention. And we are uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. That was such a brilliant presentation. And yes, applause all around. Uh, I think there's so much that we could learn from these uh, case studies and these projects that you all have done together. Uh, done individually and then brought together in this chapter as co-authors. Um, the editors of this handbook, Professor Pierre Fasse and Professor Noma Longre, are also here. And just to sort of dig in a little bit more uh, into your concluding reflection, uh, there's a question on author in chat by uh, Pierre Fasse, who's, uh, who's asking, in a context where there's pressure towards assessing the efficiency of media literacy education initiatives, sometimes beyond what is expected in other curricular or extracurricular activities, is evaluating the success of such media literacy activities a concern that is integrated into their design? If it is, then what determines the success? What are the indicators? And how are the youth that you're studying, their perspectives uh, integrated into this form of assessment? So this is related to both projects or uh, just uh, the last one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think any of you could answer based on your project. Yeah. Or both could answer. I'm just copy pasting. I will, I will try to, uh, um, how to put it, uh, maybe a bit more, uh, using a bit more euphemism, not to uh, uh, say my honest opinion of what I think of uh, how we should assess the efficiency of uh, media literacy education in initiatives. But um, so what I wanted to say about this, um, at, uh, that these were basically at least mine, and I, I think Uns is in that sense as well, mostly uh, media literacy education, but a research project. So these were not actually it did uh, provide some some sort of teaching materials eventually, but they're first and foremost research projects. So in this sense, it's a bit different of how you evaluate the success of such uh, of such projects. Um, but I would like to return to what Chick then was saying about uh, uh, participant action research. That uh, and I know it's it uh, sounds as uh, we're trying to uh, not answer the question. But actually, we do think that PAR is not about the, the product, product, but actually the process of co-creating things. So at least in my work with unaccompanied refugee um, children, um, the value of 
the simple value of them doing something else that they were doing every single day that is waiting for the authorities to give them the yes or no of being able to stay in a country, that they were able to go out and interview their peers, to talk mm -hmm. about the importance of social media or media, or talk about these things that they might have not discussed before. For me, and I know <laughs> it's not for academia in general, but for me that had a stronger value than any citation I would get on the article that the fact that we could start discussions that might lead somewhere, they might not lead anywhere, it can happen, but at least we start a discussion with people who might have not discussed these issues before. Um, it's very difficult to assess these initiatives, we all know. In general, it's very difficult to assess, and I think Pierre has written about assessing media literacy uh, initiatives, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, uh, in the school as well, as we know that in, in time, it might be that media literacy education does, does not work as we, plan, uh, as we planned it. So uh, it's really difficult. Um, and to answer your second question, and I did forget to ta talk about this, how we, uh, what is the life of these materials uh, beyond the project? Um, so initially, uh, my plan was to create um, media literacy materials for the young people themselves. But as I was carrying out the research, I realized that this group is actually so heterogeneous that I'm unable to create a, 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 a one-fit-all model of media literacy uh, material. As I said before, low literacy skills. Uh, uh, there were young people who were basically um, very interested in not being able to write or read in their own language but they were perfectly capable of using WhatsApp or Google Maps or whatever. And interestingly, that they use, they had different type of skills. They would use uh, audio messages or video messages, and they were able to come from, let's say, Syria and get to the Netherlands, which for a 14, 15-year-old young pe person, I think that's a major achievement. And we still consider them illiterate, right? Or low literate. Um, very different questions there. So eventually we decided to create um, uh, media literacy materials for the social workers that work with them um, or mentors in, the, in each country is different, uh, but there are usually one or two or more grown-ups or adults who work for an NGO or for the state who are trying to become some sort of mentors or uh, because they are without a family, someone who takes care a bit of them. So their role is, among it, uh, other things in the Netherlands, is to teach them simple things of uh, how to uh, use a bus card, how to use a bank card, like uh, simple things like this. But they are also the people who, whom they talk to if they have some issue, if they have been, for instance, bullied at school. So we decided to focus actually on these, these people instead of, of the young people as a sort of mediator. And here, just very briefly, because I know Chick then wants also to answer, um, we wanted to create new materials, but actually we realized that there's actually so much media literacy material out there, so much, actually, that it makes no sense to actually reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we actually did the curation of these materials to focus on the things that were brought up in the interviews and in the focus groups and the digital ethnography part. So I think this is another issue that media literacy should or media literacy educators should focus on uh, the wealth of, of, of curricula that's out there already. Yeah, I think I will just briefly add to uh, what Anna Maria said earlier about assessment methods. Um, I think none of us work with uh, these top-down and standardized scales of measuring media literacy, and we have a rather um, plural understanding of multiple media literacies in practice, in particular contexts. Um, so it is not about f moving from scale of, um, from uh, one to three on the scale, but more about feeling empowered in terms of using media and also raising a critical. Uh, raising critical awareness about uh, these environments and the power relations in the media environments, about platforms, for example, about your own role uh, as an individual in the platforms. 
So that was more important to see that the students in the particular project that I talked about, to uh, see that the students are raising these critical questions, that uh, they are also pre uh, presenting their own perspectives. One important thing that happened throughout the project was also that um, they could uh, bring in their own experiences with digital media into the classroom context, for example, uh, with content from different cultural contexts. And interestingly, the teachers could experience this, uh, could learn about these uh, different examples only through the, this uh, project, uh, because there is always not just within this particular school, but there is often a mismatch in the school context between the student teachers' perspectives and the school context and the students' digital lives, in a sense. And this project maybe helped to bring that bit to a uh, bit more closer to each other by uh, creating a ground to discuss these life worlds and these digital worlds. Yes, so this was the impact that I could see through my observations so to, to kind of finish that, yeah. I think uh, attendees are actually very mindful of the fact that uh, the quality of reflections that you've provided through this presentation, uh, it's just like one small tiny bit of a fraction that you've probably experienced and it would be great if you could share something that you've published or some other links in, in chat. Because attendees are mentioning that your qualitative reflections must be powerful. They'd love to read some. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was another question in chat earlier on. Given that um, these projects have been around vulnerable people, uh, what are things that researchers uh, had to be mindful of? So you've mentioned the ethical aspects of it in your presentations, but if you could little, if you could dig a little deeper to the other things that you had to be mindful of while you're conducting the research. Um, I think uh, respecting the limitations of each participant, for example, working with teachers, uh, I could see how overwhelmed they were, uh, and especially even before the pandemic, like how how much paperwork they are doing, how they are struggling also um, with their uh, teaching load. And you had to really respect that, but at the same time, create a space for being there as a researcher. And also maybe uh, we emphasize this a bit uh, in the principles too, um, looking for ways that could also benefit them. For example, by uh, looking at this teaching content together, I could also contribute to, to their contribute to their curriculum development. So that was one way of doing it or including them also in programs outside, uh, inviting them. Uh, to the other activities, for example, around the project. Um, that could be one way of thinking about this. So my, being mindful of the needs and limitations of the people um, and also their interests, I think that was one key thing among others. Well, for me, it was uh, very much um, um, the cultural differences and I think it was one of the most difficult part of the project because these young people were coming from so many different countries, um, Eritrea, Syria, Bangladesh, um, and, and some, some other countries as well. So uh, that was very difficult to bridge. And I think I could have used a few more years to, uh, to, um, to understand fully how that impacts their media use and technology use, but also importantly, um, the infrastructure that was in place in the countries they were in. So the conditions uh, would be very much different uh, in the Netherlands compared to Italy, for instance, or in the UK. Um, the fact that in some countries would uh, they would get, um, let's say, uh, a tablet, in other countries, they would need to use their own money to buy access to the internet. So these were all very different and very difficult things to bridge or factors to bridge uh, while carrying out the research. But these are all important things that we need to factor in when carrying out such uh, such uh, such projects. I think so. It's not only the people, as Chick then was mentioning, but also the context in which they are living in are actually very important. 
thank you so much. I'm afraid this is all the time we have for questions. And I can offer one minute to the editors, Pierre Fastre and Norma Landry, if you could just come off mute and uh, share your thoughts about this chapter or about the edited volume with our Candy. Yeah, do you want to go around? Um, sure, I was going to ask you the same question, but sure. Uh, <laughs> so, um, well, thank you, um, Davina. And I want to start by thanking our two uh, presenters today, Anna Marie and, and uh, Chigdem, for such a wonderful pre uh, presentation. And in the first place, for agreeing to contribute a, a chapter to our uh, volume. Uh, I, th I think this is really fascinating and, and much needed work. Um, the volume has 14 more chapters. It's actually structured in three parts. One uh, is on the research methods for studying media practices. And the chapter that was presented today is part of that, that first section of the book. And then the two other parts are on research methods about uh, for studying uh, educational initiatives, including how to assess the success of educational initiatives, even though this is a topic that would need more uh, discussion as to is it really needed to assess the success of educational initiatives. And then the third part uh, is on the, um, the research methods for studying uh, what we call prescriptive discourses, which includes, but is not limited to uh, public policies in, in media education. Uh, so we still have two other uh, webinars that are organized under the auspices of the Media Education Lab, which I thank, by the way, uh, one in early February and the other in early March, I think, on two other chapters. And each chapter will actually be in a, diff a different uh, section of the book. Um, Normand, if you want to complement what I just said. Sure. Um, I, I just want to thank uh, the presenters for wonderful presentations. Um, it's fun and important to have the variety of discussions that we have about um, in these seminars. So I really enjoyed the, the talk and I believe that the kind of work that you've been doing will be um, taking more and more space, hopefully, in North America and Europe and all over the world for the next few years. So thank you so much again. Thank you as well. Thank you for including them. Thank you so much, um, authors, editors, uh, and all the attendees for joining us. Uh, I've already shared links in chat to this particular webinar, the chapter, uh, the edited volume, um, also the webinar series, uh, which this particular session was a part of, the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series. Uh, I've also shared information about AI in the Classroom webinar series, as well as the Media Ed Club. Uh, we have uh, AI in the Classroom coming up next week. It's a very interesting session. It's going to be called, it's, it's called the AI Challenge, Tool or Tyrant. Uh, and the next Media Ed Club is in February, which is also part of this particular edited volume, Design-Based Research for Media Literacy. Uh, and the next, uh, inequalities in the education webinar series is also scheduled for February. Uh, it's called Innovative Mobile Communication in Crisis. I've also shared a link in chat for the Media Ed Institute, uh, which is a really fun way to get together and learn new things. It's a six week deep dive professional program for emerging and established leaders. Um, and it's, it's going to be fun. And you can, it's going to be async you can do it according to the time that you have and uh, it's also going to have separate tracks so you can pick what track you're interested in and yeah deep dive in that particular area of interest that is all the time that we have today thank you so much for joining us at the media education lab and i'll see you next week in the air in the classroom series thank you thank you bye thank you bye thank you, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Great.